Hi, welcome to Tessera's Nerf Room. I'm filming outside because I feel like it. It's more tactical to film out here. What is a blaster that you remember, and you remember fondly for a few seconds, like, oh, I remember that, and then after the, the fun dies down, you see, oh, I remember that. For me, there's only one blaster that comes to mind. It isn't the Warden. When I think of the Warden, I just go, no, for me, that blaster is this the Snapfire A, and I'm sure this is the same blaster for a lot of you guys watching this video. Why is that? Let's find out. So the Snapfire 8 is a 2011 release out of Hasbro in the Dart Tag series, making it one of the smaller releases in the series, and one of the more visually iconic ones, and noticeably iconic ones. Everybody seems to know what this blaster is, but unfortunately, unlike the Swarm Fire and the Speed Swarm, it's not for all the right reasons. But we'll get into everything in due time, but before I get onto the design, I need to make a quick disclaimer. This blaster is not tested. Every blaster that I acquire and do a video on goes through a rigorous testing procedure, which tests the durability, quality, and performance of a blaster, and makes sure that those stay up to standard throughout the entire duration of usage, and make sure that they will stay sound throughout my review. This blaster, I am not putting through that testing procedure at all, and there are three very important reasons why. The first and most basic reason is the fact that this is a much older blaster than stuff that I normally review on this channel. Being a dart tag blaster, this is a 2011 release and not like a 2023 release that is still purchasable on store shelves that you are going to just go down to the store and pick up whenever for like 20 bucks, 30 bucks, and actually have a chance at getting in your collection to use competitively. This video is mainly for nostalgic purposes. The second reason is a little bit more severe. These blasters are really, really hard to find. Like, really, really hard to find. And they are expensive. And they get really, really expensive and difficult to get your hands on. Which, I don't really want to deal with having to get another one if something fails on this blaster. Which leads me on to my third point. The durability of this blaster is not very good. And they love to break. They love to break almost as much as the Warden loves to break. And when I say that, I mean you guys will understand later. But with all that jibber-jabber out of the way, let's talk about the design. This blaster looks so cool. Just like every other dart tag blaster that I can think of off the top of my head, this is an instantly recognizable dart tag blaster made up of just three colors. This nice, lovely, honey-looking yellow, this dark, kind of navy blue-esque black, and the classic orange that we all know and love out of Nerf blasters. And the shape of this thing is so freaking cool. It looks like a teeny tiny swarm fire, and it really does look like a teeny tiny swarm fire. Like, seriously, here is the swarm fire without the stalk, and here is the snap fire rate. Like, not only are they the same shape, but it even has this little groove in the back, like where you would connect the stock on a swarm fire. It doesn't have the actual stock connector point, but still, it looks like a tiny swarm fire. It's so cute. What about the ergonomics? This blaster just features a main grip being a tiny little pistol, and no, it doesn't have any form of priming handle. I'll explain why later. But this grip right here is almost really, really, really good. It is a really good size. It's smooth and filleted all the way around. It's got nice texturing all over it. Look at this hex diagonal pattern like it's really really good but it has a really weird issue that just makes it uncomfortable for literally no reason and that comes in the form of this finger troil right here it is way too big and I don't mean big like in the same way that the Omnia's rev trigger is. I mean that this has the same issue as like the Spectrum or the Thunderbolt's rev trigger, where it's not quite big enough to get two fingers on comfortably, but it's not small enough to get one finger on comfortably while having your other fingers equally distributed. So you just have this really big finger troil that causes your ring finger to slightly press against this little bump where the finger troil ends and where the rest of the grip begins. And unless you re-grip your blaster low, Lower, which means that your thumb won't line up with the dovetail or higher which means that your middle finger will be cramped it is unnecessarily uncomfortable for absolutely no reason so how does this blaster work well it is an eight dart cylinder fed blaster so you take eight full length darts that stick way too far out of the barrel I, I don't know why they stick out this far it's just really weird and then to prime this blaster you put your finger on the trigger and you pull the trigger in then to fire this blaster you release the trigger slightly and the blaster will fire a single dart. Oh, but wait, uh, there's more. Because you guys may have noticed 
this thing on the bottom, this big orange button looking thing that is on the bottom of the grip. And you might've just guessed that that is just a goofy detail because it's a dart tag blaster and they have goofy details. Like, what is this? I don't know why there's a big black hole here only on one side of the shell. I don't know, but no, that is actually functional. On this side of the grip only, you can see the letters speed and power built into the side with an arrow pointing down. And right next to those is this kind of dial that is built in on the side. And this corresponds to the button on the bottom, which is actually a rotating dial. When you turn it, the thing moves. And when you turn it all the way to the lowest position, you have increased the FPS by about 10 or 15. This is, and I believe, the only Nerf blaster that has ever been officially released by Hasbro to have an actual analog FPS tuner built in. That begs the question why it's there, and I'll get that in due time. But all you really need to know is that in this state, when I fire this blaster, it shoots way harder. Like, it almost outperforms elite ranges harder. So that just begs the question, why is there even a slower power option anyway with the speed option? Any reasonable person would say, oh, we'll just leave it in the power option all the time. That's probably the worst thing that you could possibly do with this blaster. And I know to leave it in the speed option as much as possible, if not changing it ever, and just leaving it here all the time, no matter what. So you guys remember how at the beginning of this video, I said that this blaster loves to break? Well, the way that it breaks is very simple. This blaster has the power option, but it isn't really designed to use the power option for more than just a couple shots at a time here and there. The reason why I say that is because the catch of this blaster is not designed to sustain that level of spring load over and over and over and over and over. And as such, the catch loves to break. And how does it love to break? Well, it is built into the side of the shell, which means that if the catch breaks, the entire right half of the blaster has to be replaced in order to fix it, which is an unbelievable issue. Having to replace the entire catch mechanism in this blaster is inexcusable. Because on any other blaster that you could just get from the store, you would be able to take the catch out as a separate part and be able to replace it. But with this blaster, if the catch breaks, the entire blaster breaks. I would almost argue that this kind of breakage is worse than the kind of breakage the Warden has. Because while yes, with the Warden, you have to get through clips and glue and solvent welds and glue and clips, but once you get through all those clips and glue and solvent welds and glue and clips, you are able to access the internals naturally. With this blaster, if one singular, very important, very fragile piece breaks, you are completely out of luck. Unless you're willing to get rid of the nice, luxurious look of this blaster, and 3D print an entire right side of the shell for it. Yeah, I don't want to do that. I want it to look like this. Let's talk about the trigger and the smoothness of operation, which I guess we'll just start with the dial. It kind of just feels like you're opening and closing a thumb screw for a flywheeler, and it feels kind of weird to be doing this on the bottom of a grip of a Nerf blaster, but it's nothing to write home about, it works. The trigger though is really, really weird. And I'm sure there's a lot of y'all that wanna know what this trigger actually feels like because a lot of y'all probably know what this blaster is and haven't been able to try one. Well, to put it simply, it is super freaking smooth and it actually pivots upwards at an angle. Then when you release it, it has this unbelievably satisfying thunk style pop that just feels like all the internals are just nicely clipping together, like one of those ASMR videos that are all over YouTube. It is a really, really nice feeling trigger. I have no complaints with this trigger whatsoever. It just, it's so nice. Watch how it pulls in. Oh, I love it. So what mod potential does this blaster have? None. The absolute lowest amount of mod potential I could possibly imagine in my life. 
the only thing I could imagine you being able to do is trim out the dart posts and maybe remove the air restrictor so that you can make this blaster fire short darts. But I would not recommend a spring upgrade. I would not recommend any form of internal upgrades whatsoever unless you find some upgrades that are able to fix the godforsaken catch that this thing has. Like some kind of metal spacer that holds it still and keeps it from snapping off. Because the part of the blaster that breaks is built into the shell, you can't replace any of the internals with better ones because that isn't going to stop the shell from breaking. Which vindicates me because I would love to mod this thing up and use it as my main sidearm in Nerf Wars. I find this to be way more comfortable, way more ergonomic, and way more pleasant of a blaster to use than the Desperado, but I don't trust this thing. I very, very little trust it in the high power mode. I trust it a lot more in the speed mode, but even then, I still have this gut feeling that any one of these trigger pulls could be the last one that this blaster faces. All it takes is for you to hear that crunch and it's cooked. There's nothing you can do about it. So what do I think of the Snapfire Ray? Well, I love this blaster and I'm terrified of it because it is so good looking, it feels so good in the hand and it's just so fun to use, but at the same time, it's fragile. There's nothing I can do about that. There's no way to really fix that without changing one of the most elegant parts of the entire blaster, which I, one, don't have the time to do, two, don't have the resources to do, and three, just don't feel like doing anyways. So if I were you and you see this blaster out in the wild and you want it, just be very careful. Thank you guys for watching. Bye.